This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. We need to get Torah standards in this place. <laughs> and uh, the rabbis are tall. We need big standards. <laughs> okay. Ready to go? Okay. We're recording? We're on? You sure? The, the red light is on? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good morning everyone. Shalom Aleichem. It's very nice to be here. So let's, let's play a little trivia. Does anybody know, where do I come from? Five towns. Everyone thinks I come from the five towns. No, I come from Brooklyn. This is my hometown, Flatbush. And I grew up on Avenue M and East 31st. And when I was a bacher, I used to sneak out of yeshiva. Don't tell anybody. And I used to walk to Ocean Parkway every Shabbat, every Shabbos. And I used to go to, I think it's S and Ocean Parkway. I used to go to Harava, Victor Miller, Zechas Hagdabracha. For many years, for about three years, I went to Heshul every Shabbat. So I'm very familiar with Ocean Parkway. Actually, not only that, I was born on Ocean Parkway. 825 Ocean Parkway. But that's too much information that I really should not be telling you. I, so I know a lot about Ocean Parkway. I grew up on H and Ocean Parkway. Every Shabbat, I used to go to Rev Miller. And... I would like to share with you a shear, a subject. If you know the shear, if you know this already, go for pizza or something, you know, take it easy. Um, if you don't know it yet, you have to understand this insight into the Megillah in order to understand and appreciate the Yom Tov of Purim. Now, let's start with a little bit of an English lesson. Does anybody know how to say second to last in English? Second to last. Wow, very good education they get. What's the name of the seminary here? Shalshalat. Okay. Well, amazing education here. But uh, in, in real English, how do you say last in English? So, uh, second to last is penultimate. You ever hear that word? No. Okay. So the second to last is penultimate. Anybody know how to say third to last? Third to last is anti-penultimate. Okay. The third to last pasuk in Megillah says as follows. You know what? You like source sheets? Marem Akamot? It's good for you. It's good for you. Here, let's hand these out. And these are uh, sources of everything I'm saying. Yeah, and afterwards, it's better. You'll get a better mark on the test if you have the source sheets. Okay? Okay. The, se- the third to last pasuk of the Megillah says, so the, uh, this is a Sephardic seminary, right? No Ashkenazim? Not one. One. So, a half. A third. A third. One. Okay. The third to last pasuk of the Megillah says, Vayosem HaMelech Achashverosh Mas Al Haoretz V'yehayam That Achashverosh taxed the people. That's how Megillah Esther ends. That Achashverosh taxed the people. And the question is, who cares that Achashverosh taxed the people? Does it make a difference that he taxed the people? Migilat Esther is not... Is that good? I should do my fake Sefara, uh, Havara Svardit? Sounds pretty good? Yeah? I'll try it. Okay? Who cares that Achashverosh taxed the people? This is not a history book. In fact, the next Pesach in Megillah, the second to last Pesach in Megillah says, V'cho ma'aseh takpo u'gvurato you want to know the greatness of Mardachai? You want to know the palace intrigue? You want to know the history, the context? You got the wrong book. You got to go to the Chronicles of Persia and Media. There, you will see the history and the backstory and the backdrop. But this book was written for one reason and one reason only. Why was Megillat Esther written? Persume Nisa, to publicize the miracle. So if the purpose of this book is to publicize the miracle, why does the Megillah end that Achashverosh taxed the people? Who cares that Achashverosh taxed the people? So what I would like to present to you today is the most fundamental approach to understanding Megillah Esther, Chamisha Chumshei Torah, the history of the Jewish people up until our times. I'm going, to re- I'm going to lane for you a little bit Ashkenazic laning. It's good for you to hear, just in case one day, you know, you meet someone and you could say, yeah, I know, I know that laning. So you ready? 
Vayoymer HaMelech mi Bechotzer. The king said, who's in the courtyard? Vihaman ba, Haman was coming. Vachatzar beit HaMelech HaChitzona to the outer courtyard of the king. So everybody knows the story. Haman was really getting upset with Mordechai because every time Haman walks by, Mordechai does not move, he doesn't budge, he doesn't stand up for him. So Haman was infuriated and he was going to the king to tell the king to hang Mordechai on the tree. And now I'm going to ask you what this means. Asher heichin lai. Asher. What does Asher mean? That. Heichin. He prepared lai. For him. Who prepared for who? Literally, Haman prepared for Mordechai. That's what it means. Asher heichin lai. That Haman prepared for Mordechai. But the Gemara asks, obviously Haman prepared for Mordechai. Why does it have to say Haman prepared for Mordechai? Who else was he preparing it for? It should just say, Al Ho'etz on the tree, Asher Heichin, that he prepared and it's self-understood that Haman was preparing it for Mordechai. Says the Gemara, Tana, teach, Loi Heichin. He wasn't preparing it for Mordechai, he was really preparing it for himself said, Haman thought he was making a gallows 50 amot tall. He thought he was preparing it for Mordechai. In the truth, in the end of the day, he was really making that gallows for himself. What we're going to learn this morning is going to change your life forever. Because now we're going to see that the way HaKadosh Baruch Hu operates is he doesn't take the wicked person and say, Oh, that wicked person, stand right there. Bam! And a lightning bolt comes down and knocks off the wicked person. The way Hashem operates is He says, you give me the wicked guy, you give me his plans, you give me his machinations, you give me his schemes, and I will hijack and co-opt that and use his plans against him. We're going to say in Bimei Mardachai Esther. you know in Shmona Esrei, we add on Purim, Bimei Mardachai Esther. So a little halacha, if you forget to say that, do you have to say over Shmona Esrei? No, no. But you want to remember to say that. It's important to say. We say, look at number 8. Ve'ata harabim. You and your great mercy. Hefarta et atzato. You foiled his plot. Ve'kilkalta. And you corrupted es machashavto, his thoughts. What exactly are these two expressions? We have something called etza. What does etza mean? Advice. And we have machshava. What does machshava mean? Thoughts. Thoughts. What's the difference between etza and machshava? Very often we have ideas, they never come to fruition. So the Vilna, Vilna Gon says, etza is an idea that comes to fruition, that is carried out. Machshava is just a thought, but it never gets materialized. Like in the Pasuk, Rabot, machshavot, belev, Ish, va'atzat Hashem he takon. There are many thoughts in the heart of man. By the way, I'll tell you. I was talking about Rav Miller. You heard about Rav, Rav, Rav Victor Miller. I personally asked him why in the Torah the word lev does not mean heart. It is wrong to translate lev as heart. Lev means mind. Lev means mind. Ubelev kol chacham lev natati chachma. In the heart, meaning in the mind of every wise-minded person, I placed wisdom. I asked Rav Miller, why does the Torah refer to the mind as the heart? And he told me, I remember, I remember like it was yesterday. He said, according to the Torah, a thought is not really so valuable unless you have feeling about that thought. So in other words, we daven and we say, God, you created the world. But if it's just something flying through your mind and you don't feel it, it doesn't have value. The reason why the Torah calls the moach, the mind, the lev, because unless you get excited about it, unless you're enthused, unless you're passionate about it, the thought is not that valuable. So there's eitzah and there's machshava. Eitzah is a thought that is carried out. Machshava is something that's not carried out. So he says, we say, Rabot, machashavot, belevish. There are many thoughts in the mind of man. 
Va'atzat Hashem, only the final plan of God, He Takum, is what is carried out. So we're going to say on Purim, not only Hefarta et Atzato, not only did God make sure that the final plot of Haman was never materialized, but Vikil Kalta es Machshavto. God took Haman's thoughts, schemes, machinations, and he co-opted them, he hijacked them, and he boomeranged it back at him. So let's give a few examples. You ever hear of the man Ovadia? Don't say yeah, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef. A Navi. You ever hear of the Navi Ovadia? Say yeah, answer yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's one of the Navian, yeah? Good, excellent. <laughs> Anybody know which, where is he in the Navi? In Malachim, in Shmuel, where is Ovadia? In which Sefer? Tereyasar. Ovadia, how are we doing? Sorry. We're good? Yeah. Double check. I should start over? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll start over. We're good? You want to say something? Commercial? <laughs> The Navi Ovadia said the shortest nevuah in the whole Torah. He said one parak of nevuah. And it's called Sefer Ovadia. Sefer Ovadia prophecies about the downfall of Edom. Va'alu Moshiyim Mehar Tzion Lishpor Ed Har Esav V'hayital Hashem Hamelucha Ovadia prophesied about the downfall of Edom. The Gemara asks, Why did Ovadia prophesy about the downfall of Edom? Says the Gemara, Ovadia was a convert. He was a convert from Edom. The way Hashem works is as follows. The Gemara says, Menei ube Abba, Nezel be Nagra. From the forest, there used to be a song about this. Hopefully you don't know it. From the forest itself comes the handle for the axe. Does it sound familiar to you? Excellent. You passed the test. It's not supposed to. From the forest itself comes the handle for the axe. That means as follows. You have a massive forest. And one day the woodsman comes and he takes his axe and he chops down the whole forest with the blade. But where did the handle come from for the axe? It came from that forest. The same thing with Edom. Who prophesied about the downfall of Edom? Ovadia. Ovadia came from Edom and therefore he prophesies about the downfall of Edom. Now, so I want to give you an example from the Chumash. I want to give you an example from Megillah. And then we're going to bring it closer to our times. Who took the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim? Moshe. 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 By the way, Moshe's birthday was very recently, right? When was it? Two Two days ago. Happy birthday, Moshe. He was born on Zayin Adar. And his mother put him in the Nile River. Now, what do you call a baby floating in the Nile River? You know what you call him? Lunch. I once spoke in Phoenix, Arizona, so they took us to an aquarium. And in the aquarium, there was an albino crocodile. Okay? So these are vicious crocodiles. So behind the big glass, the trainer comes in, he has a stick, on the stick is a slab of meat. The albino crocodile is 10 feet away. The trainer goes like that, within one split second, the crocodile leaps at the meat, swallows the meat, and is back in its spot before your eye could even take it in. That's how fast the uh, crocodile moves. So when a baby's floating on the Nile, the crocodile comes and then has a, makes a bore nefasha rabbis in a few moments. The... the the crocodile eats the baby. That's what happened to almost all the Jewish babies. Because the Pharaoh got word, called Haben Hayilod Hayorot Hashichu. Pharaoh was told that on this day, the Savior of the Jewish people would be born. And he didn't know, would it be a Jew, would it be a Gentile? So the law was, on that day, everyone has to dump the child into the Nile. And Paro said, that's it, I'm going to eradicate the Jewish Savior. I'm going to make sure that, Moshe, that this Moshe will never be born, will never survive. And Hashem is watching the Pharaoh. And Hashem says, ah, you fool. Hashem's laughing. Really? You think that you're going to put an end to the Jewish Savior? Watch this. Pharaoh's daughter was bathing in the river. Rashi says she was converting. So she was going to mikvah. 
and she sees the baby and the baby is crying and she has mercy on the baby and she takes the baby into the palace and she's nursing the baby and she's rocking the baby and in the middle of the night uh, Pharaoh says, what's that noise coming from your room, Abbasia? And she says, nah, you wouldn't, uh, it's just a baby. He says, what, a baby? Where do you find the baby? Go back to sleep, don't worry, it's an adorable baby, it's a really cute baby. Actually, Dad, you know, I haven't slept the whole night. Would you mind holding the baby? So the Pharaoh is rocking baby Moshe to sleep. The very baby he tried to eradicate and annihilate. And an hour later, Moshe is hungry. So Basia says, you know, you maybe, maybe you could go out to the pharmacy and get him some formula. So Pharaoh runs out in his pajamas in the middle of the night and he gets baby Moshe formula and uh, he pays for his formula and he pays for his nursery school and he pays for his diapers and he, he sends him to school. And you know, Ibn Ezra writes, why did Moshe Rabbeinu have to grow up in, in the palace of Paro? Why couldn't he grow up with the Jewish people? Says Ibn Ezra, if Moshe Rabbeinu had grown up with the Jewish people, he would have had a slave morale, he would have had a low personality, he wouldn't have had the confidence to be a leader. But now that he grew up in the palace, the Pharaoh trained Moshe. So if one day Moshe's tie wasn't straight, the Pharaoh would say, one day you're going to be a king, you have to, you have to look the part. Paro groomed Moshe Rabbeinu to be the leader of the Jewish people. If not for Paro, there would be no Moshe. You know what it says in Pirkei Avot? Paro kibel Torah misinai. Remember that? No, it doesn't actually say that. But if not for Paro, then we never would have received the Torah on Har Sinai. Because Moshe Rabbeinu would not have been Moshe Rabbeinu. So the Paro thought he was putting an end and destroying Moshe Rabbeinu. Paro created Moshe Rabbeinu. If not for Paro, there wouldn't have been a Moshe. This is how God operates. He takes the Rasha, he takes the plan of the Rasha, and he uses the plan of the Rasha to bring salvation to the Jewish people. If not for the decree of Paro to drown the Jewish babies, then we never would have had a Moshe Rabbeinu then Moshe Rabbeinu would have grown up in his mother's house and he would have grown up with the other Jews and he would have been like a slave. Only because of Paro's decree do we have a Moshe Rabbeinu. Now let's bring it to the story of Purim. Let me give you a few examples. So Haman makes this ridiculous gallows, 50 amot tall. Anybody know how big 50 amot is? That 100 feet. 100 feet is absurd. You know this part, right? 100 feet is absurd. It's taller than this building. Does anybody know how tall could a person see? How high in the air could a person see? We know from Ner Hanukkah that a person doesn't look more than 20 amot. You're now to have Ner Hanukkah higher than 20 amot. You're now to have Sukkah higher than 20 amot. Why? Because the eye does not see more than 20 amot tall. So, but Haman wants to make this gallows. I mean, it's a monstrosity. It's an eyesore to have such tall gallows. Why is Haman making gallows 50 amot tall? Haman was a smart man. He knew this Achashverosh was a flip-flop. He, he can never make up his mind. One day he's angry, the next day he's happy, the next day he's calm, the next day he's in a fit of rage. Haman understood that he has to catch Achashverosh in the right mood, in an angry mood. And if in the, that angry mood, Mordechai is standing right there and Haman would say, okay, hang Mordechai. So Achashverosh in a fit of rage would just hang Mordechai. That was Haman's plan. But it backfired on him because he took a misstep with Esther and then Chavona was standing there. And Chavona said, hey, why don't you hang Haman? And Achashverosh says, oh, great idea, where should I hang him? So Chavona says, just look out the window. You see the, the Twin Towers is right there, ready to hang Haman on. So the whole plan of Haman backfired back at him in his face. Let me give you an amazing example. So Vashti is not listening to Achashverosh. Now, this is not United States of America where there's a, a democracy, 
and nobody can make a decision. You need the Congress, and you need the Senate, and you need the House of Representatives. This is a dictator. You know, probably in Iran today, if the Ayatollah's wife doesn't listen to him, what do you think he does? He takes a nuclear bomb, and he moves on. He has a chasana an hour later to somebody else. That's the way it works even today in the rulership of a dictator. Probably the kings of England, they had a different kala every Monday and Thursday. They didn't ask the House of Representatives what to do. So why is Achashverosh? Anybody know how many Medinot did Achashverosh rule over? Which is what percent of the world? It was the whole world. He was Malach Bekipa, he ruled over the whole world. So why is he? Vayoymer Hamelech Lachachamim Yodeho Yitim. The king said to his advisors, he doesn't know what to do with Esther. Why is he asking the advice of anybody of what to do with Esther? So the Megillah continues, Ki chen devar hamelech, because that was the law in Persia. The law in Persia was that any time the decision is not about something that's going to happen in the country, it's a decision about what's relevant to the king himself. The king is what is called nogea bedavar. You know what nogea bedavar means? He's biased, yeah? So he can't make the decision on his own. So the law in Persia was that any time something was relevant to the king himself, the king has to ask the advice of the Chachamim. So the question is, really? The king always has to ask the advice of the Chachamim? So then, who's the next queen of, queen of Persia? After Vashti? Esther. Esther. When Achashosh wants to get married to Esther, so you think his advisors, his advisors go over to him and they say, Achashosh, who are you marrying? Um, Esther. Okay, what nationality does she come from? Uh, I don't know. Who's her father? Uh, I don't know. Is this a good idea? Do we find Achashosh asking anyone's advice when he marries Esther? No, he just marries her. How about at the end of the story when Haman took a misstep with Esther and Achashosh comes back into the palace and Achashosh is enraged and Charvona says, oh, hang him on the tree. Do we find that Achashverosh asks anyone's advice what to do with Haman? No, he just hangs him. So what happened? Why in the beginning of the story, Achashverosh is asking everybody's advice what to do with Vashti, but to marry Esther and to hang Haman, he doesn't have to ask anybody's advice. Ready for this? Says Vilna Gaon says the Malbim, says a commentary called Yosef Lekach. There was a man by the name of Mimuchan. And Mimuchan made the following proposal in Persia. Vayoymer Mimuchan lefnei hamelech vahasarim loyal hamelech levadoi avisa vashti hamalka. Mimuchan says, Are you out of your mind, Achashverosh, that you have to ask the advice of your officers and your assembly, why would you have to ask any advice? And if you take a look, I see you want to know where this is, number 41. The Vilna Gaon says, you know what Mimuchan tells Achashverosh? Im al ha-melech ta'iv, im al ha-melech ta'iv, yeitzei dvar malchus milafanav, if it pleases the king, from now on I propose a new law in Persia. Yeitzei dvar malchus melefanov. From now on, you call all the shots. You make all the decisions. Don't ask anybody's advice. Achashir, you're the king of the world. You should be able to decide what to do with somebody when they don't listen to you. So we have a new legislation in Persia that Achashverosh calls all the shots. Does anybody know? Who is Memuchan? Haman. Oh, Chazak Baruch Haman. For your new legislation. You legislated that Achashverosh could call all the shots. Now, because of your law, Achashverosh could marry Esther. If not for your law, nobody would have ever let Achashverosh marry Esther. We don't know what country she comes from. We don't know who her parents are. So, who is responsible for Achashverosh marrying Esther? Haman. And then when the king gets angry at Haman, and Chavonah says, why don't you hang Haman? 
Who's responsible that Achashverosh doesn't have to ask anybody's advice? If he would have asked the advice of his assembly, they would have said, no, he's a good guy, he tripped, he fell, it's not his fault. But because Memuchan legislated that Achashverosh calls all the shots, Memuchan Haman dug his own grave. So watch how God is using the plan of Haman, Memuchan, to backfire against him. I'm going to give one more example, and then you're going to see how the whole story comes full circle. Haman was very worried. That Does anybody know? Okay, Whoever knows the answer to this will get a book? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, right? Okay, sounds good. What day did Haman decree that the Jewish people should be killed? Zayin Adar. Really? <laughs> what day did what day did Haman decree that the Jewish people should be annihilated? Yer Gimel Adar. Well, I have to give like nine people a book. No, 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 no. Yer Gimel Adar. Yer Gimel Adar. What did the decree say? So we, we think, it said, that everybody get ready on the 13th of Adar, all the Gentiles, all the Amalekim will kill the Jews. No, Haman was afraid to write that. Because if word ever got out that on the 13th of Adar, the Gentiles would kill the Jews, then you know what we would have done? We would have gone to the governors and the mayors and we would have bribed them and we would have paid them off and we would have uh, gotten out of the decree. So Haman made sure not to write what would happen on the 13th of Adar. You know what the document said? Take a look in number 23. <speaking in Hebrew> The documents that he sent through the runners said the Jews will be destroyed, annihilated, and murdered on the 13th of Adar. That's what it said to the official, on the official document sent to the governors. But look in the next Pasuk, number 23, Pasuk Yedal. Patshegen HaKetav. The text of the document, that was revealed in every country, revealed openly to the people. You know what the document said? Be ready. And what? The documents didn't say anything. They just said, be ready. Because Haman wanted it to be covered up until the last moment. So all the documents said, Lihiyot atidim layom azeh. Be ready. You know, beware of the Ides of March. Get ready for that day so that nobody knew what was going to happen. This is one of the biggest miracles of Purim. Because when Esther said, Hey, Achashverosh, you know, I'm a Jew. And that evil Haman, he wants to kill us. So Achashverosh said, Okay, nothing I could do about it. Ki kitav asher nechtav b'shem hamelech v'nachtom b'tabat hamelech I cannot rescind the decree. I already signed it. I already sealed it. I can't rescind it. I can't take it back. So Esther said, yeah, you can. You know why? Achashir said, I already put my signature on it. Esther said, yeah, but it didn't say anything. All it said was, be ready. So Achashir said, so what do you want me to do? So Esther said, we'll just tweak it. Instead of be ready that the Jews get killed, we'll tweak it. The Jews will kill their enemy. So Haman thought by not writing in the document, he would sort of not let the cat out of the hat, not let the cat out of the bag, what was going to happen. But because he didn't write on the document, we were able to tweak the document and then turn the tables and kill our enemy. This is the great manner of Hashkacha Pratit. It call, it's called Al Ho'etz Asher Heichin Lo. On the tree that Haman made for Mordechai, he really was doing it for himself. The way God operates is he doesn't have to knock off the wicked person. He could take the wicked person, use the wicked person's plans to backfire against him. And now I want to show you 
the most astounding example of this in the Megillah. But we have to fast forward about 10 years after the story. Did you ever hear of Sefer Ezra? In Ketuvim, Sefer Ezra. Say yes. yes. Excellent. Okay. Sefer Ezra. Perak Vav. We read about the Jewish people after the Purim story. They return to the land of Israel. And what's the first thing you think the Jewish people want to do when they return to Israel? They want to build Beit HaMikdash. And the king at that time was a man by the name of... Anybody know who was the next king of Persia after Achashverosh? What? <laughs> Daryavesh. Excellent. Daryavesh. And the, king, uh, the Jews turn to Daryavesh and say, Darius, help us out. Could we build the temple? And Darius says, yeah, go for it. And the Jews say, well, you know, we don't have money. So Darius says, okay. And he opens up the royal treasury and he takes out all the tax money and he helps the Jews build the second Beis HaMikdash. And I ask you, where do you think Darius, who, by the way, who is Darius? Darius is the son of Esther and Achashverosh. Do you know that? Achashverosh marries Esther and they have a child named Darius. And Darius opens up the royal treasury and he gives all the money of the royal treasury to the Jewish people. Where do you think Darius got all this tax money from? The Megillah ends off that Achashverosh taxes the people. All the tax money went into the treasury. Darius inherits the treasury. He opens up the treasury and he funds the building of the second Beit HaMikdash. Watch how the Purim story has come full circle. The story begins, Achashverosh is having Seuda. What's he celebrating at the Suda? That the Navi Yirmiya said that after 70 years the second base of will be rebuilt. Ah, oh, Achashver says, you see, it's not being rebuilt. It will never be rebuilt. Achashver is celebrating that the second Beit HaMikdash will never be rebuilt. And by the end of the story, Achashver has become the chief fundraiser to rebuild the second Beit HaMikdash. Watch how the Purim story it's come full circle. Now, let's backtrack to Achashverosh's party. He's sitting there at his party. He's opening up his treasuries. Chazal say he had 1,080 storehouses of treasures. And he took out six treasures every day of the 180 days. And he asked Achashverosh, What are you celebrating? What are you so happy about? She says, I'm celebrating. The Jewish people will never rebuild second Beit HaMikdash. And God's laughing. You think this Suda is celebrating that they'll never build second base HaMikdash? This Suda, you're going to get angry at Vashti. You're going to kill her. You're going to marry Esther. You're going to have a kid, Daryavesh. He's going to take all your money. And he's going to rebuild the second base HaMikdash. So you think this party is celebrating the destruction of the temple? This party is rebuilding the second base HaMikdash. It's the ultimate irony. It's the ultimate v'nahapochu. It's the ultimate example of how Hashem takes the plan of the Rasha Achashverosh. And Achashverosh thinks he's celebrating Churban Beit HaMikdash. And that Suda is the cause of Binyan Beit HaMikdash. Why does Hashem operate this way? Say the students of Vilna Gaon that in the Galut we don't have open miracles. Hashem is not going to split the Red Sea for us. We're not going to have Barad falling down from heaven. There are no open miracles. So how can we see clearest that it's Hashem who's pulling the strings? The clearest manifestation of Hashem's control over the world is when Hashem takes the Rasha and He takes the plans of the Rasha and He uses those plans against Him to bring salvation to the Jewish people. So let me give you two examples closer to our time. You ever hear of Lakewood Yeshiva? Yeah? yeah. It's the biggest yeshiva in America. You, you know where it is. Where is it? In Lakewood. Also, good answer. It has something like, I don't know, if 5,000 Talmudim, 8,000 Talmudim? 
Anybody know who built Lakewood Yeshiva? Very good. Okay. <laughs> Rav Aaron Cutler. But that's what you thought. Let me. No, you're right. You're right. He built it. But it really goes back further than that. So there was a king and a queen. And they were on a mission, it's called Reconquesta. And they were trying to conquer the entire Iberian Peninsula. Rid it of all Muslim infidels and expel every last Jew from the Iberian Peninsula so that the Jewish people will never have a home, never have a haven, never build yeshivot, never build any Jewish institution. Their names were King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And they set the date for the expulsion of the Jewish community for August 2nd, 1492, Tisha B'Av. You know that? That the expulsion of the Jewish community was August 2nd, 1492. They get a knock on the door. Yay, hey, what do you want, Christopher? I have a great idea. We're going to expand Spanish power. I'm going to discover a new continent and we're going to expand... Jew, um, Spanish power to America. Okay. And who's going to pay for it? Haha, <laughs> that's why I came to you, Christopher Columbus tells Ferdinand and Isabella. You're going to pay for it. You're going to finance it. We said, okay, great idea. So on August 3rd, the day after the Spanish Inquisition, Christopher Columbus set sail to discover America. And who paid for it? Ferdinand and Isabella. They thought they were expelling every last Jew. There would never be a haven in history where the Jewish people have communities, yeshivot, batei knesiot, tamidim. And who discovered and paid for the greatest haven the Jewish people have ever had outside the land of Israel? Ferdinand and Isabella. That's how Hashem operates. He takes the rasha. He takes their scheme. He takes their plan. And he uses their plan to backfire against him. I'm going to give you one more example. In the last 200 years, who do you think has been, the, which country has been the greatest enemy of the Jewish people? What would you say? The last 200 years. Most people would say, Germany. They killed six million Jews. Yeah? However, you can make the case that Russia has been the greatest enemy of the Jewish people in the last 200 years. In the 19th century, they had a plan to destroy the entirety of the Jewish people. There were millions of Jews in Russia. They were going to murder a third, expel a third. A third would assimilate. And actually, the greatest butcher in the history of the world was Stalin. Stalin killed 20 million of his own citizens. And in 1948, in the War of Independence, this is a fact, when Jewish people were fighting for a homeland, the Jewish people were losing the war in 1948. And Stalin got in his sick mind that, you know, he doesn't like the British in the Middle East because they're democratic. But the Jews were socialist. Stalin said, well, they're, they're socialists. They'll probably be communist. So Stalin funded the War of Independence. You know that? Stalin is the one who financed the War of Independence. Not only that, he sent Russian troops to fight for Israel in 1948. Not only that, when it was put to a vote whether the world would recognize Israel, Stalin voted to recognize the state of Israel. So if you want to know why there's a mirror yeshiva today in Yerushalayim, Joseph Stalin, Yemach Shemay V'Zechrei. Can you imagine how Hashem takes the greatest Russia in history and uses that Russia to help the Jewish people? But let, let me end off with one final Purim miracle. This was all in 1948. In 1953, Stalin had a change of heart. Stalin saw that Israel was not going to be communist. Ben-Gurion was currying favor with America. He saw Israel was moving toward democracy. So Stalin had a change of heart. And he created something called the doctor's plot. He charged six doctors 
on trumped up charges that these doctors were poisoning Russians. Stalin built railroad tracks from the heartland of Russia to take the between 2 and 4 million Jews in Russia to Siberia. In Siberia it's very cold. You know how cold it is in Siberia? Between negative 75 and negative 95 degrees. In two weeks, all 2 to 4 million Jews would have died. And if you don't think he was going to do this, he already built the railroad tracks, he already built the concentration camps, and it was going to go into motion March 6th, 1953, exactly 70 years ago. What are we today? What's it? March 2nd? This was going to go into effect March 6th, 1953. Actually, Tainis this year, March 6th is, I think, Tainis Esther. Stalin had this decree, it was going to go into motion. That year, Purim came out, Motsoi Shabbat. One of the great Russian refuseniks, Rabbi Yitzchak Zilber, was reading the Megillah, Leil Purim, right before this plot was going to go into effect. And he's reading the Megillah, and when he finishes the Megillah, he turns to the other inmates, and he says, you see, you see this story? There was a Stalin 2,000 years ago, and Keheref Ayin, in the blink of an eye, God turned the table on him. And God knocked him off. And we had Yeshua. It could happen in our times. And someone who was there said to Rabbi Silber, what are you telling me nonsense about what happened 2,000 years ago? It's a fairy tale. What are you telling me? What does that have to do with Stalin? Stalin is strong like an ox. Whatever Stalin plans, he brings to fruition. He already built the railroad tracks. He already made the concentration camps. He's primed in a few days to destroy Russian Jewry. Whatever Jews were left from Hitler, Stalin was going to knock off. And Rabbi Yitzchak Zilber said, he's only basar vadam. He's only flesh and blood. A human being doesn't know what, what's going to be even in 30 minutes. Rabbi Yitzchak Zilber said this, 7.50 p.m., Leil Purim. 33 minutes later, a few days before Stalin was going to kill out Russian Jewry, miraculously, suddenly, 33 minutes after Rabbi Yitzchak Zilber said this, Stalin stroked out a young man. He needs a doctor, he needs a doctor. No, he already imprisoned all the Jewish doctors. There was no doctors for him. And he was left to die. And Rabbi Yitzchak Zilber said that he had a moral dilemma. Can I daven? Can I pray for Stalin to die? And he said, of course I could pray. And he said to Hillim again and again and again and again and again. And on March 5th, 24 hours before Stalin was going to destroy Russian Jewry, Stalin died. 70 years ago, on Purim. 70 years ago to the date. This was the, the great miracle of Purim, 1953. Where look how God manipulates this Rasha. When we needed him, when Hashem needed him, he had Stalin fund the War of Independence. He had Stalin vote on the, on the establishment of Eretz Yisrael. He had Stalin fight in the war. And as soon as he turned the table, God said, we're done with him. But he was strong like an ox. He was healthy. Just like that. Yeshua Tashem Keheref Ayin. So from the story of Purim, we see that Hashem doesn't need to knock off the Rasha. Give God more credit than just having to knock off the Rasha. God says, you give me the Rasha. You give me His plans. You give me His schemes. And I could hijack His plans and use His plans against Him. This is the great limud of the Purim story. So it doesn't matter, friends, who the president is, who the prime minister is. You don't need to have a friend of the Jewish people. Sometimes Hashem works in very mysterious ways. Even someone who doesn't look like our friend, Hashem uses them. He pulls the strings. They're just pawns in Hashem's hand to bring us bracha and Yeshua. So we live in challenging times. We know that the different regimes and countries of the world, they're not, they're not our good friends. But don't worry. Breathe easy. Mishanichna sadar. Marbim b'simcha. Hashem is with us. 
any enemy, Hashem is able to just pull the string and use the enemy to bring Yeshuot, Nechamot, Lanu, Ulechal Yisrael. Amen. I wish everybody a happy Purim. Thank you very much. Thank you.
You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.